According to the cloud. This meeting is being recorded. Uh, okay. All right, I'm gonna let everybody in. Okay, here we go. Welcome everybody. We're just going to give it just a, a minute or so just as everybody enters the enters the event. Do feel free to put yourselves in the chat, say hello to each other if you'd like. Let us know where you've come from today. Hello, for those who are just joining us now, we're just going to give everyone just a moment to, to come into the room, find the Zoom link and get settled. We'll be starting in just a minute, but do feel free to use the chat, say hello, uh, let us know where you've come from this evening. Ah, California, Israel, New York, oh, goodness. Go, just letting a few extra people in as we go. Oh, uh, looks like Miranda, you might need to just check on the BMS on the museum here. Ah, somebody from London and from UCL. Excellent. Great. Just going to give everyone just a moment. Massachusetts. Goodness me, from all over today. This is very lovely. Um, there's a few people who are still joining in, but I'm just going to get started. Um, uh, apologies, I'm sitting in the dark. It's... Um, uh, in the museum and we're just uh, moving from daytime events to evening events and the system is resetting itself. Um, but I'm just going to do a, a quick hello and then I'm going to, to hand over to everybody. So good evening and welcome to this evening's event. It's a, a collaboration between here at the Jewish Museum London and the Parks Institute. Um, I'm Francis, I'm the interim director here at the museum and it's my pleasure to welcome you uh, to this event. Uh, in fact, I'm actually welcoming you, though you can't see it quite clearly yet, you will later on, from the new research centre, which is where um, a lot of our work is taking place with the records, and we'll give you a little bit of a, an introduction to that later on. So over the past uh, two years of COVID, we've been exploring lots of new ways of working, and one of these successes has been developing the partnership with the Parks Institute and our desire to sort of support more academic research and researchers through the over 40,000 items in our collection. So later on, I'll give you a little peek behind the scenes of what that collection looks like and the research centre. But um, just to let you know, just before we get going too much, uh, we will be recording this evening, so if you don't want to be um, videoed, then do turn your video off, but keep using the chat um, and put their questions in there. I'm going to hand straight over to Claire Lefoy from um, the Parks Institute. Claire, over to you. Hello, thank you very much, uh, Francis. Uh, I'm very pleased also to be here. So my name is Claire Lefort and I'm the director of the Parks Institute for the Study of Jewish Non-Jewish Relations. So for those who don't know about us, so we, we are a research center based in the Faculty of Arts and Humanities at the University of Southampton. And we are named after the Dr. Reverend James Parks who fought tirelessly against anti-Semitism and racism both in his scholarship and in his activism. He understood very early on in the 20s that anti-Semitism was on the rise in Europe and he helped Jewish refugees to escape Germany. He also helped to found the Council of Christian and Jews. And we are named after him because he offered his library to the University of Southampton in 1964. And since then the Parks Institute has grown to become an interdisciplinary uh, research center that 
that study Jewish non-Jewish relations from the ancient to contemporary times and in a very interdisciplinary approach. Outreach work is also uh, at the heart of what we do. And we are a community of scholars, archivists and librarians, but also of students. And tonight's event will be a wonderful opportunity for two of our current and past PhD students to show and present the research that they have conducted using archival materials from the Southampton uh, Special Collections and from the Jewish Museum London. So really many thanks to Frances and Miranda for co-organizing co this very exciting event. And I will now, now pass on to my colleague, uh, George Gilbert uh, from the Parks Institute too, and who is coordinating PhD studies at the Parks Institute. Hello everyone, um, so thank you very much for joining us and it's great to see such a big turnout at the event. Um, as Claire said in her introduction, I'm George Gilbert, I'm a lecturer in modern Russian history in the Department of History at the University of Southampton, also a member of the Parks Institute. For the past couple of years I've been directing the doctoral community at the Parks Institute. Um, we have a doctoral seminar that runs every couple of weeks. It's eagerly attended by a good number of our students who work on many very interesting projects across enormous range of time and across different um, disciplines. I think two things that are quite unique about the doctoral community at the Parks Institute are the fact that we cover such an enormous time frame with students undertaking dissertations on ancient history right up until very contemporary topics, but we also unite students who are working on different fields, English literature, history, philosophical studies, um, and also other, other, other subjects entirely. I don't really think there are actually many communities out there, any university that really perform diachronic as well as synchronic functions of the Parks uh, Doctoral Community Institute. And it's always a great pleasure to convene the community and every few weeks hear about one of the students, what they're up to on their very interesting research. Um, we're joined by a couple of our park students tonight. Um, and we're first going to hear from Nicola Woodhead, um, a, a Parks doctoral student who's undertaking some really interesting work on the um, kinder transport in 20th century Britain and thinking hard about how that's uh, reflected in the memory, what might be true or false in our uh, understanding of the kindersport, kinder transport as a kind of as a, as a project. Um, so we're going to hear from Nicola in a moment. I'm really happy that Nicola is able to join us and contribute to the event. Um, and just to say for myself, I'm very pleased to be involved. I'm happy to be picking up the questions at the end from the audience. And I'm looking forward to some pretty interesting and I'm sure very uh, lively discussion following the event. Um, and it's a great pleasure to be involved and a great pleasure to see members of the past and present uh, doctoral community in the audience, actually, which is fantastic. Um, so thank you very much for listening to me. Um, and I'll pass over now to Nicola. Hi everyone, thank you George for the introduction. Um, so I'm Nicola, I am a PGR at Parks Institute researching the kinder transport um, and I'm also one of the postgraduate representatives. I just want to echo very briefly on what George has said about um, the postgraduate uh, community at the Parks Institute. Um, so we have a really flourishing community in Southampton which reaches London and further afield both in the UK and abroad with people attending um, our events. Um, and it's been such a fantastic environment to be doing my research on, uh, to share ideas and to work collaboratively. Um, so this group is such a nurturing and welcome community and it's been a pleasure to be part of it and even more so to represent it this year. Um, so I'd like to hand over now to the first of our panels, um, but I'm not sure that Katie's back yet from technical issues. Um, so I don't know if we could maybe swap um, and have Jennifer um, and Karen start because I think Katie still has no Wi-Fi down in the gallery. <laughs> um, so first I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Jennifer Craig Norton, who is an independent scholar and visiting fellow of the Parks Institute, University of Southampton. She is currently teaching remote courses on Holocaust memory and Jewish refugees at the University of Paderborn, Germany, and writing a book on Jewish refugee domestics and nurses from 1938 to 1950. So she completed her PhD on the kinder transport at the University of Southampton under the supervision of Professor Tony Kushner, which she later published as the kinder transport contesting memory. Um, she also was the co-editor of Migrant Histories and Historiographies, essays in honor of Colin Holmes um, with Christard Hoffman and Tony Kushner, 
and she has published numerous articles on both the kinder transport and Jewish refugee domestics. Um, and then immediately following Jennifer, we will hear from Karen Robson, uh, who is Head of Archives and Special Collections um, at the University of Southampton Library. So I would like to hand over to these two um, and look forward to hearing what they say. Start again. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm really thrilled to be invited to this event. Um, I did finish my PhD a few years ago, um, but um, it's an honor to be amongst this company and to represent the Parks Institute and also um, the special collections at um, the University of Southampton. And so I've just prepared a really short presentation uh, featuring four documents that I encountered in my research, which um, was also about the kinder transport. And I um, published my, my PhD research um, as a book, The Kinder Transport Contesting Memory. Um, and it was based um, primarily on um, two major collections that I um, encountered at the University of Southampton. And the first one that I encountered um, I, 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 I was um, struggling to find um, resources, archival resources on the kinder transport. And I went into the, um, to the collection of Solomon Schoenfeld. Let's see if I can make my slide move here. I'm not sure why it's not advancing. There we go. Um, and apparently there's... Um, so, this is a really major collection um, at the University of Southampton. It's a very vast collection. Um, Solomon Schoenfeld was a very active um, rabbi and um, very, very active in refugee work in the 1930s. Um, so in his own collection, of course, there is made up mostly of his own correspondence, but within his collection, um, unexpectedly, I encountered the files of about a hundred um, children, a few more, that um, had been brought to this country on a kin three, three small kinder transports from Poland and um, by a very um, little known uh, Jewish refugee organization called the Polish Jewish Refugee Fund. Um, and it was really these files that I discovered of these children, which were quite complete files, which is quite unusual. The, materials from most of the children who came on the kinder transport, the original correspondence and other things that were in their files were destroyed, um, some during the war, some after the war. So this was a, a, an extremely rare collection. And as I was going through these, um, these files, it became quite clear to me that the correspondence um, fell fairly neatly into four major piles. So um, of course, the, the largest was um, that originating from the Polish Jewish Refugee Fund, their correspondence with other um, refugee organizations, um, with the people who were caring for the children, uh, the children themselves, and some um, fairly small amount of correspondence with the parents. And so I chose to highlight um, one document from each one of these groups, the refugee organizations, the um, carers, the children and, and the parents. So I'm gonna start with um, a really, um, I think, interesting document from the refugee organization. Um, this was a very small, small um, group uh, who were running this um, Polish Jewish Refugee Fund. Um, and I wanna point something out on this, the first page of this document right here. Um, if you can see, if you look at your screen really carefully, you can see that there's some typing on, uh, a faint typing. And this was because they had to reuse their scrap paper. And these were the handwritten notes of their um, 
of, of their one home visitor. Um, he also was a refugee. His name was um, Dr. Lipman. And this is the, um, the handwritten uh, report that he made uh, of this visit to one of these little girls that you can see at the bottom um, uh, to her foster mother. And he would then, you can see that some of the items are crossed out. He would then type up these reports and he would take out, he, he, the, the typed up reports are much drier. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to highlight this report is that it clearly um, gives you a sense of his own personality, what he felt. He, he kind of excised a lot of the more emotional things that he wrote um, when he visited um, these families. Uh, but in, in the case of this little girl, I'll just um, read a couple of, of excerpts from this um, document. I visited with Mrs. Davis and had a long conversation with her. She informed me that Sonia was healthy, attending school and preparing for a scholarship examination. Um, Mrs. Davis, as far as I could see, Mrs. Davis, who is childless, is very attached to Sonia, whom she treats as her own daughter and whom she would like to adopt and to make, and so to make her a British citizen. If Sonia wins a scholarship, Mrs. Davis would like her to go to a secondary school and she hopes to marry her to a nice English Jewish boy. She celebrated her birthday a few weeks ago with a cake with 11 candles. I give all these particulars to show that Sonia Baranska is in good hands. And in my opinion, she is one of the very best well-kept Sponchin children. Sponchin was the town in, in Poland from which th these children had come. They, they were part of, um, all of them had been born in Germany um, and they had been expelled with their families from Germany in the so-called Poland action at the end of October, 1938. And then he continues, and this is on page four, and he's crossed this out. It doesn't appear in his uh, typed, typed up report. But everything is not all right, even with Sonia. She has a twin sister to whom she is very attached, which is quite natural. Her twin sister is in Birmingham with Jewish people. Mrs. Davis tried hard to find Sonia's sister and at last succeeded. However, her sister's foster mother, her foster parents object to Sonia visiting her sister or even writing to her. This causes Sonia much suffering and worries the kind Mrs. Davis. I promised her we would do our best to help Sonia communicate and visit with her twin sister. Um, so a document like this, um, it, 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 it's so important because it gives some sense of the personality of the writer um, and of the situation, the, one of the situations that arose um, with the separation of siblings. Um, and to give, uh, I, I was just so delighted whenever I would open a folder and I would find one of Dr. Lippmann's um, handwritten reports because they, they gave a real sense of um, if he was, affronted by something. He was quite upset by the situation with uh, these two little girls and how they were being kept apart. Um, and, uh, you know, very um, complimentary of, of Mrs. Davis's um, treatment of, of her foster child. And then there was one more note that I thought was very interesting that gave you an insight into him. Um, he mentions in this report that he wasn't able to um, speak with Sonia because she was at school and Mrs. Davis invited him to stay and wait until she came home from school, but it was going to be two hours, so he chose not to. Um, and then he said, besides, there is little use in talking to a child in the presence of the foster parents, which I thought was a very um, insightful thing for him to say. Of course, if the foster parents are around and, and the child is unhappy, they're not likely to um, you know, say this to the home visitor. So this is just one of the many documents from, from the organizations that, that um, told this human story, which all the four documents that I'm, I'm going to highlight here um, do the same thing. Um, this might seem a funny document to feature. <laughs> you can see that um, you have a drawing here um, labeled left and right. Um, this was included, it was, it's obviously it's full size um, of a, about a 12 year old uh, boy's foot, 
or around his stockinged feet, as you can see from the text here. Um, this foster mother um, was an evacuation foster mother, so she hadn't, um, in a way, it was a little un involuntary. She she didn't really wasn't really given a choice. She she was um, basically told she had to take this refugee um, child in as a as a evacuee, um, and so she had to deal with how was he going to get clothed and 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 and, and shoes and so on would be provided because um, most other evacuees who weren't refugee children had their parents to send them clothing. These children relied on charity. And so this was um, just part of a letter she had written thanking the Polish Jewish Refugee Fund for the summer clothing that they sent, but the shoes are much too small. And she explains that the shoes they sent were American for some reason. Um, I'm given to understand that their sizes are different to ours, but I have enclosed a diagram of his stockinged feet as though, as I thought that might help. Um, to me, this was when I unfolded this and I saw the drawing of this child's feet to somehow it just was um, it was a delightful thing to come across. It was such a, a human touch. And I could just imagine this foster mother, you know, making this little rough diagram and then folding up the paper and sending it away. Uh, and it just gave, again, this sort of very human um, insight into the relationship between foster parents and their foster children and the kinds of things that the, the foster parents had to deal with um, when they had refugee children in their homes. The third um, document I want to briefly highlight is a letter from one of the children. And this was a young man. He had just turned 18, actually. He had come when he was 14 years old or 15 years old, almost 16. Um, and what is really unusual about this document, um, there are letters, quite a few letters from the children to the refugee organization, but this happens to be in a letter that he wrote to his landlady, who was a bit like a foster parent to him. Why it was in his file, I, I can't really explain. You know, I don't know how the, the, the foster parents must have given it to the Polish fund um, and they put it in his file. So this was extremely rare and it, it has a different feel than the kinds of letters that they would write to the to the refugee organization, it's much more personal. Um, and you have to remember these children had all been separated from their parents. So um, uh, they had, had endured family separation. They had no one really um, except foster parents, possibly people at the refugee organization to confer with about their life plans, about, um, you know what they wanted to do with their lives or even any kind of small victories that they uh, encountered in their lives and and this is one of those letters and um, this young man his name was Heinz he changed his name to Henry and he writes to Mr. and Mrs. Sugarman I know you wondered yourself why I didn't write for such a long time but I think you'll understand the reason we had a concert and I didn't have one free minute during the whole seven weeks and I was pretty finished afterwards. So tonight, I think I choose the right time to write. The audience at the concert was about 600 people. I was, however, a success. All the people to whom I talked after the concert agree with me saying that I should train my voice very soon. So I think the right moment has come to do something about it. You know my wish is to be a Hassan, to be a cantor. But I don't want to be a Hassan only. My wish is to have a generally knowledge in music too. And Leeds is now, uh, is no way to do something about it. I would like to hear your opinion of my plans. It always seemed to me you had a certain interest in my plans. So again, you get this insight into um, this, this young man. He, he wants someone to help him make this decision. His father had been a, a, a well-known cantor and he had trained for that himself from the age of four. And so he, he had a very good voice. He also um, says, I think you can see on the second page, Parker's in, in capital letters. He tells them um, that he received a, pa a parcel from the American foster parents scheme in uh, his foster parents in Chicago, who we'd never met. Um, they sent me a Parker's fountain pen and pencil. I was the first to get something like it, and I was certainly very proud. 
I think it's really very nice that so strange people are taking an interest in me. Um, so this is one of the very few letters that really gave you a, a, a sense of the personality of these children and 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 the kinds of things that um, that they missed because they didn't have their parents around um, and the kinds of things that they wrote when they um, when they were communicating with someone who they felt um, was concerned about them and, and their lives. Um, the final document uh, I want to show is one of the handful of letters from parents to the refugee fund um, as they were trying to get their children rescued. Um, this was from a mother. Um, this was actually, this was the last document I encountered in this file, and it was quite a heartbreaking one. As you can see from the photos enclosed, um, she had these four boys. Um, this one picture in the middle was taken right before they were deported in, uh, later that year. Um, and she is writing to um, her, one of her boys, the one on the, the far right in the photo, had already been taken on a kinder transport in, in February of that year. And she was very much hoping that her two, uh, two of her other boys would also come. And she describes in this letter in very broken English um, about her children, um, the youngest one, um, second from the right is was about 14. She said, my sons are not able to understand the Polish language and have no possibility to learn anything. They speak only English, Germanic and Hebrew. They are very clever and intelligent children. Enclosed, you will find photos of them. It is a pity really if they would stay here. Every day which, pa which is past is a lost day in their life. My children are loved wherever they come. I believe there is nobody who can imagine what a terrible situation I am in. It is cruel for me as a mother to see her children in such a situation. Dearest Mr. Doctor, I would thank you all the life if you can do anything to help my children. Um, sadly, um, none of the other children were able to come and the entire rest of the family perished in the Holocaust. Um, so, I'm, positive my time is up here. Um, but I just did want to show you the richness um, of a collection that really no one knew was in there. Um, these are only four hundreds, if not thousands of documents that I looked at um, uh, concerning um, children who had come on kinder transports. Um, all of them fascinating and um, full of um, detail that give um, insights into uh, what they experienced as kinder transportees, what their parents experienced, and the challenges um, that were faced by the refugee committees and also the people who cared for them. So, thank you. Karen, if you would like to now. I'll hand over to you. Okay, thank you. I'm very, very pleased to be with you this evening. I'm just going to try and share my screen with you. Just bear with me. I'm not sure if this is going to work or not. Oh, there we go. I hope you can see that. Uh, this we is the have your PowerPoint. Sorry, can you see that? No. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, ah, oh. okay, sorry, well, let's try this again, should have tried this earlier, shouldn't I? Yeah, that's working now. Sorry, you can see something? Yeah, yeah. Perfect, thank you. Okay. Although um, we can, sorry, can we can just see um, the Zoom call, not your PowerPoint. Ah. I don't have a PowerPoint. I was just trying to link to a, ah. an archive, the archive catalogue. There we are, yeah. Yeah, okay, perfect. Right, thank you for that. Sorry, the technical issues there. So, uh, hello, I'm Karen. I'm the Head of Archives and Special Collections at the University of Southampton, which is based in the Hartley Library, which um, is the largest library of the university. 
Um, our holdings of Anglo-Jewish material is quite considerable, probably numbering about 4 million manuscript items. That's made up of several hundred separate collections, uh, which range in size from things that would probably just make up a folder of material to something in the range of two and a half thousand archival boxes of papers. The largest proportion um, date from the 19th and 20th century, but we do have a title deed that dates back to the 1200s as well. Um, the material is very wide ranging and it provides an important uh, source for the study of Jewish communities in the United Kingdom. Um, the collections encompass papers of individuals and families and of organisations with both a national and sometimes international focus. Uh, for while the um, focus is anglo jury the collections reflect the migratory nature of the Jewish community and its global ties. Now, papers of individuals um, include um, prominent figures within the Anglo-Jewish community, such as Selig Brodetsky, Louis and Israel Zangwill, Nathan and Neville Lasky. Uh, we've got private papers of three chief rabbis, and also we have papers of members of families such as then Henriquez, the Swavelings, and the Whaley Cohens. Um, the collections also encompass material of West of lesser well-known individuals that offer a fascinating insight into the many different facets of the Anglo-Jewish experience. Um, an example is the 45 volumes of someone called Samuel Rich, who was a member of the, of the London community um, in what he termed his Journal of a Man Minor Anglo-Jewish Communal Official. Um, the volumes cover the period 1904 to 49 and an elegant eloquent commentary on the development of the Jewish community in London and on national and international events. Um, archives of organisations um, similarly encompass a vast spectrum of activities within the Jewish community um, and they include uh, material on philanthropy and social work, education, protests and campaigns, uh, women's rights, religious practices and observances. Two very different examples are the archives of Rabbi Solomon Schoenfeld, which Jennifer's already mentioned, which contain extensive material relating to the work of the Chief Rabbi's Religious Emergency Council. Um, and the material relates to its refugee work, but also its reconstruction and rescue work in post-war Europe. The second example are the papers of the Women's Campaign for Soviet Jewry, those women in black, who campaigned for the rights of Soviet Jewry from the 1970s onwards. Um, the material not only provides a rich source for study of the Anglo-Jewish community, um, as well as other communities of the diaspora, but it also supports a wide range of research activities, both those studying at Southampton, but also from scholars across the world. Information on our holdings can be found in the new Apexio archive catalogue, uh, which we launched at the end of 2021, um, and which can be accessed at the following link. Um, it is a, an amazingly detailed resource of many of our collections, um, but for a uh, short cut to finding out what we might have, um, I would recommend looking at the browse collections, which do actually take you straight to information about lots of our Jewish collections. Um, you can, as you can see, quite a range of different material there. Uh, and we also have the featured collections, uh, which will be, uh, which at the moment we're focusing on a number of our major collections. So we have Jewish Care, we've got Parks, Schoenfeld, um, the Women's Campaign for Soviet Jewry, um, Solomon Cook. Um, it's a great way of finding out about the collections. It's the main way to really um, interrogate uh, information about the collections and I would recommend having a look at it to uh, to uh, access information about what we hold. So there we are. Thank you very much. Um, I'll just try and stop sharing my screen. Thank you. Thank you both um, very much for such illuminating talks about some of the treasures in the archives in Southampton. Um, so I'd like to move now to um, the next panel, um, before we take questions at the end for all our panellists. Um, so I'd now like to introduce Katie and Francis, 
Um, so Katie Power is a PhD student at the Parks Institute for Studies of Jewish and Jewish Relations um, and is the Parks Institute Digital Officer. Her doctoral research focuses on the history of Yiddish theatre in London during and after the Second World War, with particular focus on the, the development of Yiddish arts theatre in London. So Yiddish theatre in London has attracted little scholarly attention, and so her thesis sets out to rectify this while demonstrating that London was home to a Yiddish community which uh, reacted to the atrocities of the war and a renewed effort to establish a modern secular Yiddish cultural hub in London. Um, and Frances Jeans is the interim director of Jewish Museum London. So I'd like to hand over to both of them now. Hello. Um, so thank you for joining me. Um, I'm sorry for the slight technical weirdness at the beginning. I hope you can all hear me okay. Nicola, can you give me a thumbs up? Yeah, oh, lots of nodding, that's great. Um, so thanks again, Nicola, for that introduction. I'm honoured to be here actually in the Jewish Museum London this evening, um, which is home to a collection of over 40,000 items of, what, of which just a handful I'll be mentioning in this talk. And in fact, I'm actually in the History Gallery and you can see behind me their dedicated Yiddish fear to display. And while the items showcased here are not the focus of my talk tonight, it's incredibly exciting to be sharing a story with you while in their presence. You can see costume pieces, play scripts, posters, all of which are essential sources in our understanding of Yiddish theatre. They capture moments of performance history in one way or another, but it takes more to tell their story. So how do we use these sources to write the history of the Yiddish theatre? Now, all historians um, have such questions and there's doing their research and analysis. But as I've discovered throughout the course of my research, this serves as a particular challenge when researching performances. So when I think about it, plays such as The Merchant of Venice, The King of Lampedusa, A Goldfarden and Dream, and um, these are just a few plays that grace London's Yiddish stage, um, performed in Yiddish, of course, those are the English titles, and they received high praise. But what made these plays great in the eyes of their audiences? And what exactly did they see? What did they hear? When we hear that the acclaimed Yiddish actor Maya Zelnicka um, performed Shylock and, and you know, received great reviews, how did he actually act the character? How was it characterized? I will never be able to see the performances to tell you. And there are no video recordings of the performances that I've just referred to. But while the performances themselves are lost to us, the things that surrounded the performance and helped to make it possible the, final correspond the financial correspondence, the playbills, the promotional posters, even marked up scripts, they survive. And it is these items here in this collection that have helped me piece together an extensive database of performances known to have been staged in Yiddish theatre in London and helped me to unravel the details of these performances. So in the time I have tonight, I'm going to demonstrate how these items helped me understand one particular performance. And this is London's new Yiddish theatre company's 1946 production of William Shakespeare's The Merchant of Venice. And this was staged in Yiddish at the Adler Hall in Whitechapel, the heart of London's East End. Now, London was no stranger to Yiddish theatre in the 40s. It had been brought to Britain by immigrants from the Eastern Europe from the late 19th century. And performances in music halls and taverns were common in times before an established venue. The repertoire of the theatre ranged from comedy to tragedy, drawing on Yiddish folk tales, adaptations of classics and stories of immigrants' lives. For many of these hardworking immigrants, a night out at the theatre was a rare opportunity for entertainment and relaxation. This tradition of the Yiddish theatre continued throughout the first half of the 20th century, and London was the only European city to hold regular Yiddish performances throughout the Second World War. In fact, there's documentation to suggest that they were done in the air raid shelters. And in the immediate aftermath of the war, two companies thrived, and those involved committed themselves to the continuation of Yiddish cultural life. So I'm going to share some images now, sources that I've used from the archive here. So just bear with me while I do that for you. There we go. So it was in this context that the artistic director of one of the new Yiddish theatre company, Avish Mezels, completed a translation of Shakespeare's The Merchant of Venice. There was a great deal made of the fact that this was indeed a literal translation, translation unlike other Yiddish translations, which often made changes to core scenes to change the interpretation. 
but translation was not in fact entirely word for word. And I will explain this in more detail shortly, but I have no reason to believe that it was a significant deviation and it was a matter of changing lines as opposed to other productions which cut entire um, apps and things like that. So for those who are unfamiliar with the plot of The Merchant of Venice, I'm gonna read you the very short synopsis that Shakespeare's Birthplace Trust have um, prepared and it's, um, it's quite reductionist, but just to give you an idea of the context. So Antonio, an anti-Semitic merchant, takes a loan from the Jewish Shylock to help his friend to court Portia. Shylock holds a grudge against Antonio for his lending practices and apparent anti-Semitism. Still, he offers the loan, but instead of charging interest, seemingly as a kind of joke, he asks for a pound of Antonio's flesh if the loan isn't repaid within three months. Antonio can't repay the loan, and without mercy, Shylock demands a pound of his flesh. The heiress Portia, now the wife of Antonio's friend, dresses as a lawyer and saves Antonio. Um, so it's very reductionist, um, but the idea that this play is sort of seen as a comedy, um, since it ends in marriage rather than death, and the idea that good triumphs is, is something that's been debated lots, and there's lots of literature out there about it. Um, but given the ambiguous role of the Jewish um, Shylock in this, it was a brave decision to stage the play so soon after the Second World War, when the horror of the Nazis' treatment of the Jews was so fresh in people's mind. As I say, you can see here the poster itself, which um, is one of the ones that's held in the collection here. But moving on to um, actually the source of this. When considering the reason for staging the play at this time, I asked myself, what was the motivation, rationale and origin story for the decision to stage a new translation of The Merchant of Venice. I turned to the theatre's very own publication, the Theater Spiegel or Theatre Mirror. The collection here features a number of copies of this monthly periodical, which was published in English and Yiddish by the New Yiddish Theatre Company. Um, it's, it's quite impressively, it's an absolute treasure trove of information um, in terms of what was going on. And you can see here that from the front covers of the edition prior to the opening of The Merchant of Venice, that they had different front covers for Yiddish and English. It's an incredible source, um, and it tells you so much about this era of Yiddish theatre. And it's not just about the new Yiddish theatre, it actually talks about Yiddish theatre overseas, Yiddish culture. It features articles, pleas to Jewish youth to learn Yiddish and support the theatre, and much, much more. It has been invaluable in my research, and it's just a shame that it was only published for a handful of months. And one thing I do wish to point out um, on here, you can see it in the poster on the previous slide, um, just at the top. Um, the English language part that says New Yiddish Theatre Folk House um, in association with the British Arts Council. Now, this is quite an interesting side piece of uh, really information here because at this point, the theatre was just newly being um, funded by the British Arts Council, which is an early incarnation of what we know today as the Arts Council. And I have little doubt that this newfound affiliation with such a prestigious organisation motivated the company's decision to put this play on. It was an opportunity to show the range of the Yiddish repertoire, added an air of prestige, and not only the company um, felt this, but also the performance itself. It made people interested in attending. But back to my question of rationale. Translating a Yiddish edition of this title led me to an article written by the tra play's translator, Mezels, answer answering this in a piece that's titled, um, just translated from the Yiddish, how did we come to put on the play, The Merchant of Venice? Um, now, I, I found this in one of the, um, say here, the editions of Theater Spiegel, and I translated it as part of the research. So just to surmise um, what it talks about. It explains that the idea of performing the play in translation was first pitched to him by their press representative, George Fearon, in the spring of 1946. At first, Meisels was reluctant for fear that people would not take the production seriously. Yiddish audiences had a stereotype at times to be unruly. How could such an audience um, have a proper appreciation for Shakespeare's work? And saying this, it's interesting because it, it, this wasn't new. Shakespeare was performed in Yiddish many times before this. I think The Merchant of Venice was first performed in 1899. So it wasn't new, but it was still a concern for Meisels. But he saw the suggestion as a challenge and aimed to disprove the notion that Yiddish theatre was not able to or worthy of performing it. And it was this initial perceived unworthiness or inability to perform that led them to seek the expertise from the highest of standards. The press rep representative, having heard these concerns, contacted Robert Atkins, former director of the Shakespeare Memorial Trust Theatre in Stratford and co-founder of the Regent's Park Open Air Theatre. Atkins, who spoke not one word of Yiddish, 
nor did he understand any, agreed to take part in the project. However, he agreed on the basis that he would do three rehearsals and if he did not like it, he would withdraw. And I really think the fact that he did not speak or understand one word of Yiddish makes his appointment quite incredulous. Um, but when questioned about this, Atkins said that the translation was so literal that it did not matter that the, he did not understand the language. As a specialist in sta staging the Shakespearean repertoire, Atkins was well acquainted with the text and was able to focus on the performance and delivery, leaving the issues of language to Meisel and the rest of the company. And much to the company's surprise, after three rehearsals, Atkins expressed his great astonishment and said that he would like to continue. Having a Shakespeare expert like Atkins on board was a mark of prestige and his involvement brought with it the guaranteed fidelity of the production and it made the company feel more confident in staging it. Now, moving on to think about the staging itself. Here we can see a picture. And as I said before, I don't have a recording of this performance. So these sort of photographs are invaluable to me as a source. The first of these you can see here is taken from backstage and it shows Maya Zelnicka in his costume as Shylock alongside director Robert Atkins on the right. And um, yeah, on, in the right, he's on the right. And in the middle, it's um, Zelnicka's daughter, Anna who was playing Portia in the play. Now, this is actually another reason it was a landmark production. As far as I know, it was the first time, and maybe the last, um, where a father played Shylock to his daughter as Portia. Now, my immediate reaction to this photograph um, on a very sort of you know, superficial level would be the costumes. Seldom did Yiddish theatre in London at this point have access to such lavish costumes as we see here. In her memoirs, Anna Zelnicka recalls that the company were able to spend lavishly. They opted for historical, like historically accurate costumes to maintain the authenticity of the piece. And you can see the effort has been put into them. And I've got another picture here from the collection that I've accessed where we can see uh, more of the cast. And this time we can see Anna Zelnicka in another costume, but similarly lavish. We also get a preview of the set which were elaborate considering the stage was very small. This was not a purpose-built theatre. It really was a hall. It was called the Adler Hall and it really was one. Um, and one thing that they talk about a lot in the Church of Spiegel is that they had a set designer. So they did have people making this in-house. And I think the funding from the Arts Council probably allowed them to push it further and make that extra effort just to ensure that they had legitimacy to the performance. Now, this photo actually shows the, the um, trial scene in The Merchant of Venice. And this is a really pivotal scene in the play. It's the scene where Shylock is prevented from taking a pound of Antonio's flesh by Portia, who is disguised as a male lawyer. A photograph of such a key scene in the play is wonderful item for research purposes. Analyzing the choices made by Meisels is part of the central part that I write on the case study of this. So this brings me back to the idea of a word for word translation. This is so often attached to this production. And in the absence of a script, it was my initial reaction to trust this. Yet during an afternoon here at the museum consulting their volumes of the Jewish Chronicle, I found a review of the play that does in fact mention that small changes are made. For example, the sharpening of the knife is removed from the trial scene. But frustratingly, the review does not detail the other changes. It was instead in the annotations of the reviewer's programme that I uncovered a tiny nugget of information that answered this question for me. The museum's collection houses the original programme used by the reviewer, and it is covered in notes about the performance to help inform his review, which is standard practice. And in this, there is an indication of one of the core changes during the scene. Now I've put on screen a famous quote, a famous speech from um, The Merchant of Venice. Many of you may be familiar with it, but if not, it's there for you to look at. It ends with the line, the villainy you teach me, I will execute and it shall go hard, but I will better the instruction. When I examined notes in Meisel's personal papers in the YIVO archives, inspired what I'd found here in the museum collection, I noticed that Meisel had in fact changed this line a number of times and finally settled on the following. So he replaces it with, I will do better than you have taught me. Here we see an insistence on the identity of the instructor um, indicating a sense of provocation and justification of revenge. And again, this is something that's discussed a lot in secondary literature about this. And um, if anyone's interested, there's lots of reading I can recommend on it. Um, 
I explore this in much greater detail in the thesis, but for the purpose of today's talk, I wanted to use it to highlight how such a small thing in a collection, such as a reviewer's programme that has annotations on it, has led me to find information on something far bigger and more interesting from a research perspective. The play was a considerable success. Running for six consecutive weeks to sold out audiences, in fact, I bring you back to this picture um, from the cover of the October 1946 Theatre Mirror, and I, I'm calling it the Theatre Mirror here because this was the English side. And here we can see a photograph of audiences outside of the theatre waiting to see the show with the caption, sold out, hours before the beginning. Um, and I think it's interesting that they chose to display this on the English side and not on the Yiddish side. I think this was a conscious choice, no doubt a way to ensure that the English speaking audiences knew the play was a success and was the hottest ticket in town. It made people curious about what they were missing and further generated sales. I've also used various archives here at the Research Centre, um, the archive, sorry, collections of the newspapers here at the Research Centre, so both Yiddish and English. And in these, I found a number of reviews of the productions. Um, they were very much positive. Zilnica received incredibly high praise for his portrayal of Shylock. Um, a lot of people talked that it was very, you know, that he restored humanity in Shylock. There's also much said about the unusual choice to stage the play. Unfortunately, um, I'm not actually able to show you these reviews at the moment as I don't have digitized copies of them, but the sheer number of these covering both English and Yiddish press is testimony to the play's wide reach and London's audience, attracting new audiences. And in Meisel's eyes, the play was one of the company's greatest successes. So I'm just gonna wrap up here, but just before I do, I just want to reflect on the purpose of this talk. There's far more to be said about this production. And for those interested, it will be detailed as a case study in my doctoral thesis upon completion. I'm thrilled to say that I've actually recently located, I know that there is a script, uh, it will, Meisel's translation is in fact at the Evo archives. And so I'm hoping to consult this in the future. Um, which is very exciting because it means I'll really be able to go much more depth about the literature side of it. But I hope this talk has given you an insight into how archive collections here at the Jewish Museum London can be used when researching things that we can't see or watch back, things that are limited inf we have limited information about. In my case, it's helping me to understand performances that I will never see. And there are, of course, limitations, and these are discussed extensively in secondary literature. But I think these items are still incredibly useful. And when we draw upon a large variety of these sources and try to collate as much as possible, we are doing something to create the picture we did not previously have. So I always feel incredibly honored to share these tales and um, I always feel very sentimental. So my final thing to say on the topic really is it's wonderful to be here in a room. And while you can't see it, unfortunately, behind me is that in fact, um, in the case is Meisel's typewriter. And um, it's, it, I, I feel very honored to be sitting here, I guess, in front of it. And I like to believe that he possibly used this to um, write his translation of The Merchant of Venice. So thank you all for listening. Thank you for the Jewish Museum London for opening up their collection to me over the years and for hosting me this evening. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the programme. Thank you so much, Katie. That was so engaging. Um, uh, I always love hearing from researchers uh, when they've looked into the collection and they've seen um, things that we've just never, never known before. It's it's so thought provoking. Um, I'm just going to uh, give a, a quick glimpse into the research centre actually that Katie's been um, so eloquently talking about um, in her in her presentation. Uh, this will only be a, a few minutes of behind the scenes looking, and then we're going to open up the Q and A session. So if you've had thoughts and questions as you've been hearing all the speakers do feel free to start popping those into the chat and uh, the administrators will start picking those up but I'm just going to quickly share um, my screen as well you had all the screens this evening so I would like to just uh, talk you through a little bit about the research centre just because we've been discussing it um, so much this evening so the research centre is our new space in the museum uh, this is something that we decided to focus on actually over the last two years and, and with uh, COVID, making it sort of reevaluate uh, the privilege of space that we have in the museum. And one of the things that we are very keen to do is to support researchers. And the Research Centre is our, our new approach to engagement. So I'm just going to give you a quick behind the scenes tour of what this space looks like. So many of you will know the museum's collection well already, I'm sure, um, but as a, as a quick summary, we have over 40,000 items in the collection. We have uh, around 2,000 items of art as well. Uh, we have a photographic collection. Uh, we have our Holocaust 
collection and we also have our contemporary collecting program which is all about collecting the here and now as history is made um so everything you can imagine from textiles to um pamphlet material right through to medals um uh we're merged in with the jewish military museum with ajax so the collection is the jewish community across uh, from medieval times into literally yesterday. So the collection is extremely, extremely varied, but obviously there are aspects which are very under-researched. So the research center and library is a very active space. The space is used by staff and volunteers who are carrying out active collections care work. So that's everything from digitization, uh, sort of digitizing 40,000 items um, requires space and time. So the team are working very hard on that. But it's also where we do any sort of um, repair work. We might have objects out for staff research and volunteer research, but also where we can bring out any one of the 40,000 items to anybody um, who wants to have a, access to that collection. All you need to do is come into the museum and let us know in advance, if you can, what sort of objects you're after and the collections team will bring those out to you, um, absolutely to your hands to have a look at. So in this space, you can do a few different things, carry out your own research, if you want to just pop in and, and see this sort of uh, work that's going on, you're also very welcome to come in and sit with one of the volunteers or staff members who's doing the, the digitization program. So that's something you can just pop in every day and, and take part in. And there's also longer term research opportunities that are going on. So we have a sort of a priority list of things that we think actually deserve a little bit of attention research wise. Um, and those are um, things that you can uh, commit to a day, commit to a week, commit to a year. Um, it's things that really we think could really use that little bit more attention. So what can you find up here in the research library? So there's a few different things. The biggest part of the access and opening up access was actually bringing out the FOIL research library. So up until now, the library has been closed to the public mainly. It's been up in the offices with staff. 2000 books came out onto open display when we launched the research center in uh, July this year. So that means you can come and you can sit down and you can spend all day here if you'd like uh, and access any of the 2000 books that are on display, which includes the entire back catalogue of the Jewish Chronicle in bound volumes. So a huge amount of material just within that sort of space. Uh, I've got a few things on the screen there which talk you through some of the uh, collections that we have in the in the library, but I mean, I would say pretty much any topic you were likely to find something into into their library there. Using the research library is completely open to everybody. So we have uh, academics and students, that's from undergrads right through to PhD students that we've heard tonight. Um, but we also have family historians coming in, professional researchers uh, who are doing work for books and that sort of thing. General visitors as part of their visit are very welcome to stop and to, to use the books and to request objects to have a look. Um, but you'll also find other museum professionals up there as well. Lots of museums are looking at um, new exhibitions. They come in to look at the objects, look at the research catalogues and, and create their own programming as well. One thing we're very keen on is also sharing this research. So we absolutely want you to come in and, and do this research um, and look into the collection, but we want to find ways for you to share that with others as well. So as part of the new sort of collaboration aspect of this work, we're really encouraging people to think about ways they can do this. That can be everything from donating copies of research papers to the reference libraries so we'll build up that collective knowledge on the collection but we also have display space in the research center so you can put on small exhibitions choosing objects from the collection or bringing in other objects for that as well and really creating a space there's a space of video um, you can give tours a real space to really sort of share that knowledge but we also have obviously a lot of digital work after the last couple of years. So we do regular object talks and events like this. So lots of ways to share that research going forward. And the last thing to mention is the Jewish Genealogical Society of Great Britain, who have just moved in to the museum uh, over the last couple of months. So they brought another, goodness knows, um, another thousand or so books with them, as well as all the family trees um, and all the other work that they have done over um, a very long period. They're very well established, as many of you will know. Uh, and they hold regular sessions up in the research library as well. So there's a real opportunity to think about how we connect um, the research they have done with the collections and the research that's carrying on um, outside of that as well. Hopefully, uh, lots of you will be uh, intrigued by things that you can see in the research centre. We really do welcome you uh, to come in. All you need to do is, is come into the museum as a, as a regular visitor, or if you'd like to book a research table, just go onto the website and you can book a table for the day or for the week, um, or even for the year, and carry out your research uh, as much as you would like. 
I shall stop there and I'm going to pass to George, who's going to think, lead us through our Q&A session. George, over to you. Thank you very much for our speakers for some very interesting talks. And thank you very much also um, for a great wraparound discussion of the kind of the respective collections of both the Park Institute and also the, um, the Jewish Museum. Um, I'm sure there's going to be lots of questions from the audience. Um, I did drop a message in the chat about five minutes ago, and I'll just reiterate this now just to say that if you do have any questions, um, you can use the raise hand function in the, uh, the list of icons at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to pose that question to me in person, as it were. Not quite in person, um, so I can see you essentially virtually. Or if you'd rather not do that, you're very welcome to write the question to me in the chat. And if you want to direct message me a question, as a couple of people have already done, you're very welcome to do so. I can see there's a few hands up already, which is brilliant. Um, I did have a question, um, a few questions in the chat that have been in, in there for a few minutes. So I think I'll go to those and maybe do them one at a time, I think. So there's still plenty of time, I think, for questions. Um, so this is a question from Rebecca Singer and it's to Katie and Jennifer. Um, what ways do you find most successful in telling the wonderful stories contained in these archives to a wider audience? So I wonder if Katie or Jennifer would like to pick up on that. I don't mind going first because um, in many ways, actually, it's, it's quite nice to be here with Jennifer. So one of the things I've done with the Parks Institute is I'm one of their digital officers. And um, we're really keen on bringing our collections and we're very lucky to have Karen and the special collections team letting us build digital exhibitions. And for me, this is a really exciting way to bring our research to wider audiences now. And um, it's taking it away, I guess, from the academic scope in many ways, you know, like where people are used to getting things from archives and actually putting them to a much bigger audience. And I worked with Jennifer over summer on a project to do this on actually the paper she's talking about today. So um, it's, that's my chosen way. And I think trying to do events where you're using your research in a bit of a less academic way. So for example, when I've researched The King of Lampedusa, a Yiddish play, we performed that, we staged that. And that's a way to get new people in to see it without actually telling them they have to be interested in Yiddish theatre in London as a historical research point. Um, so I'll, I'll see what Jennifer has to say, but you know, that's how I like to do it. <clears throat> Well, the exhibition that we put together as a part of a, a sort of course on the on the kinder transport and Katie did a fantastic job and it was a great way to um, to highlight a lot of these documents, which really, you know, the, the kind of correspondence that I highlighted, it needs to be read, it needs to be thought about and, and you know, considered and obviously some more context around some of those documents would be helpful as well. Um, one thing that I did when I was um, a PhD student is I did a lot of outreach work with um, six form colleges um, and down to children as young as um, I would say probably 10 or 11. Um, often they they would come to the university and I would do a session and I would always use some of these documents because um, in many cases, these children were the same age as, as the children that I was talking to. Um, I would kind of try to pitch whatever the presentation was um, to that age group. There were plenty of documents so I could pick and choose um, to sort of, ha you know, get the get these children engaged in um, the kinds of things that um, that these refugee children had had to encounter and handle as after they were separated from their parents and brought to to the UK. So obviously that was one way in which I was able to um, take these documents out of the archive and into a wider public um, that might not, you know, pick up my book or read an article in an academic uh, journal or whatever. So, um, uh, yeah, that, that was one really good way to, to bring the, these, these really important um, archival materials out into a wider public. Okay, thank you, very, thank you very much, both of you, for those really, really detailed, I think, observations that I'm sure have really helped the audience. Um, so I'm going to move on. I can see just hands up. There's just one more question in the chat that was there before the hand from Grace. So I'll come to this now. And this is from Tony Kushner. 
and this is to Fran about the oral history material about, at the Jewish Museum. It's kind of a two part question from Tony. The first part is how accessible is this collection? Um, and also how accessible do you aim to make it? And if you could talk about that collection in general terms, I think that would be appreciated as well. Right? Yeah, of course. Um, thank so you. Um, thank you, Tony. So the oral history collection, I think, is um, uh, one of the trickiest to digitize. It's uh, a lot of it, a lot of the, the oral testimony itself was um, in the 70s and 80s and therefore is on a different kind of format than we would use today um, to process audio. So it is definitely more challenging um, than some of the other items in the collection. What the collections team has started over the, particularly the last sort of, I'd say, 10 years is transcribing them initially. So the items are, um, let's say they're on cassette, those have been transcribed and those are readily accessible. So through the museum website, there's a search the collections function. Through that, you can search for absolutely anything within the collection uh, and those will come up. If the items are transcribed, then there will be um, the ability to then ask the collections team for those. So you just follow the link and it'll say if you want to request them and they can send you the transcripts. Um, for hearing the actual audio, the only way at the moment for most of it, I would say is coming into the museum and we can set people up in the research center with, with the equipment they need in order to access it. Uh, it's definitely on our list. So we are just about to embark on a three year program. We've just received funding for the first year. Uh, the first part of that is uh, an update of our collections management system, so where we store all the information about the entire collection. So that's all going to be upgraded. And as part of that, it's going to make everything much more accessible um, digitally. So all the images that we have of items, um, any sound recordings, anything like that. So that's going to be a, a three year program, um, which will include a full audit of absolutely everything in the collection. Uh, and hopefully we'll, we'll discover quite a few things, I think, that probably have, have not seen seen. Um, seen the light today or, or been included in exhibitions or been uh, near researchers as well. So I would say, yeah, oral history is potentially the hardest one on the list at the moment, um, but it, there are transcripts and the, the available copies here if you'd like. Sorry to jump in on this, but I just want to say that the um, oral testimony collection here for Yiddish theatre is incredible. Um, it's one that's, I think it's the earliest thing I used when I started. It was the, um, it was with the, the cassettes, headphones in a little office. And um, I believe David Mazawa is here, but I know he conducted a lot of these interviews and they've all been transcribed and they are an invaluable source. So I know for sure with Yiddish theatre, the oral testimony collection here is superb. Ah, oh, that's great to hear. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Um, I think they're a yeah, very useful addendum at the end. Um, so now coming up, coming to a question, uh, or a question I should say, the hand is up and from Grace Fordham, who's been very patient, I think, waiting whilst I've got in for the first couple of questions in the chat. So I'd just like to say, hi, hi, thank, hi Grace, thank you very much for joining us. Um, and very keen to hear your question. Hi everyone, well, I was a student at Southampton myself a little while ago, so it's been uh, nice to be back in this space and it's been great listening to you all. I've got a question for Jennifer. Um, so I remember visiting an exhibition at the Jewish Museum in Prague, which featured the drawings of children who had passed through the Theresien ghetto. I was wondering if we have much access to non-written source material like children's drawings that can help us kind of understand the experience of the kinder transport children in the UK. Um, in the collections that, that I've looked at, you know, they are quite constrained by the fact that this correspondence is all coming to a refugee organization. And so in many ways, it's quite um, formal. Even the letters from children are rather stilted. Um, you don't really know, you know, they're usually asking for something. This is one of the reasons why the letter I highlighted was so unusual because it wasn't a child writing to a refugee organization needing something. But one of the things, and I, I do mention this in my book, there is a, quite a gap in these um, collections in that the voices of younger children are quite absent because obviously they were not writing themselves. There, you get quite a, a good idea of the concerns of children, we'll say, who were 13, 14 or older. But the younger children, really, there, there's a, there's a there's very little from them and virtually nothing that is non-written. Um, 
And I don't know, I don't know where you would find anything like that um, in the UK. I mean, I want to stress here again how the collections at Southampton, how rare they are, um, in that, um, as I mentioned, um, the children who were sponsored by the um, Refugee Children's Movement, which was the major refugee organization, there are there is there is archival material on them held at the London Metropolitan Archives right before the pandemic hit. They were beginning to open it up to um, pop, to researchers, so obviously that hasn't been exploited to any great extent at this point. But what's in those files are are just um, uh, records of contact. So they're just a form that shows maybe a couple of sentences of a, a home visit or a phone call or whatever. It's nothing like the kinds of, of richness of correspondence that can be found in this, this collection that I found in the Schoenfeld um, uh, collection. And then there's also the collection, I don't know if Karen mentioned it, of the West London Synagogue, which also um, brought about eight, between 80 and 100 children to the UK and then looked after them in, in, in an aftercare way. So those are also extremely um, rich files. But again, um, you know, it is um, constrained by the fact that these were um, definite um, the relationships between these children and, and the refugee organizations and, and their cares. So um, there are, you know, there are some insights that can't necessarily be gleaned from from these documents. Of course, thank you. Thank you, very, thank you very much. I hope that hope that answers your question. Um, I think it's very good. You know, we've had some excellent discussions so far. Um, I've got more questions in the chat, which is great. Um, I think next I'm going to come to Nicola, who has had a hand up quite patiently for several minutes. <laughs> So I think it's high time we hear from you. Then I'll go to Claire in the chat and maybe I'll take a few more kind of questions that where people have got the hand up. So hi, Nicola. Yep, hi. So I have hi. a question for Katie. Um, so I noticed um, in one of the photos, um, or the photo of the trial, um, the piano, it looked like a score. And I know obviously you research like musical theatre um, in like Yiddish theatre. So I wondered if we know if there was any musical element to this performance um and if so like what might that have looked like um or if there's any like indication that there was like music accompanying this um so, yeah thank you and um, it's a good question actually because i i i too looked at it for the two musicians there um in that picture which i thought was quite interesting and it was an element i um wanted to talk about and i have here with me luckily enough i can find it a copy of theatre mirror from my from my personal collection not not stolen from here i promise but it does say at the bottom um and this is this is just another example of how these sources often just give you your answers um but the play itself included incidental music composed by rosabelle watson and then traditional music um is unlisted it just says traditional music and then the overture was specially composed by hans block now i haven't heard any of this music and i haven't seen any scores in any of the archive um, visits I've done and I've um I've been thinking the last few days that maybe it's I'm not sure if I expect music in the Merchant of Venice really but there definitely was music in this production and whether that's a side effect of this this seeming need sometimes in Yiddish productions to have some sort of song to make people attend or maybe this music was quite incidental throughout and it was just atmospheric and I wish I knew that um but I'd love to get my hands on some scores as with the King of Lampedusa, that would be great, a new project. But yes, there definitely was music. And I think what you said here is testimony to this idea that you see a picture and it opens the doors to so many other thoughts. So thank you. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so I think next actually, we've got a, a question from Ch uh, Claire Lefoll uh, from Parks in the chat. Um, and this is directed at Karen at our own special collections. And the question is, Karen, could you tell us about the digitization projects at the special collections? 
digitalization projects. Yes. Um, we, we are reviewing our various collections and um, we have, uh, along with the archive management system, we have acquired a new digital viewer for the library, which we're developing at the moment. So we will be looking at um, various projects that will enhance the digital uh, provision um, of the collections here at Southampton. Um, at the moment, as I say, we're at the planning stage and we're looking at different collections that we might work on. Uh, one of the suggestions is possibly the James Parks collection, but we are also reviewing some of our um, notable Jewish collections and um, that is something we'll be developing over the next a uh, few years to, to, to enhance, but we will be announcing more information on that as these collections and the projects develop. I'm sorry, it's a bit vague at the moment, but we are, as I say, still in the planning stage, but I hope at least that starts to answer your question. Thanks. Thank you very much for that, um, Claire, and thank you very much for the response, Karen. Um, so next we're gonna to come to Caroline Smith. Um, I can see your hand's been up and you've been extremely patient. So you'd like you. to join us. Thank you. Um, brilliant evening. Um, I'm a PhD student at the University of Winchester. Um, um, I'm researching Jewish religious rituals. And I had a question for Jennifer. Um, the, the children that were fostered, were they always fostered to Jewish families? And if not, what was done to help them um, practice their religious rituals and engage in, in, in religious festivals? That's a fantastic question. Um, and in fact, there I found a lot of material on this question. Um, a lot of material that wasn't known, I think. Um, the short answer to were they all put into Jewish homes is no. Um, actually, um, the Polish Jewish Refugee Fund did not accept non-Jewish offers of hospitality. However, um, even though they had arranged Jewish foster homes for all of the children they brought over, which was a small number, about 170, when the war came, um, the vast majority of these children were evacuated. And in evacuation, the refugee committees had no real control over where these children were placed and where they were sent, there were very few Jews. So even well-meaning um, groups like the Polish Jewish Refugee Fund um, found their careful plans th thrown into disarray. Uh, I mean, it's one of the reasons Dr. Lipfin noted that these twins were both placed with Jewish people. Um, and um, interestingly enough, the, the one I was um, in, the, in the report that I showed, he talked about the fact that, that the child had been evacuated and was very unhappy. She was not in a Jewish home. And the foster mother went and got her and then um, brought her back to London. And then when the Blitz began, she went into evacuation with her rather than have her put in a non-Jewish situation. But that was extremely rare. Um, there really was very little provision made to keep these children connected to their Jewish um, heritage. And this is one of the, the most um, controversial and saddest legacies of the kinder transport. And it's very um, little known. I have a large section in my book that is devoted to discussing this issue because some of the most controversial issues, interestingly enough, um, concerned children that were brought over by the Polish Jewish Refugee Fund who had been sent in evacuation to um, remote places in, in Devon and, and, and there was an, and, and a few of them were, um, you know, converted and baptized as Christians. And this was quite a scandal in the, in the Jewish community. Um, so um, I would just say, <laughs> you, maybe you could get a copy of my book and read that section because I think it would answer all of your questions. And, and, um, and I couldn't have come up with this material, you know, with this, with these answers uh, that I do lay out in the book without the material that I found at Southampton. Okay, I will do. Thank you, Jennifer. 
Thank you. I'm just going to quickly post a link in the chat to the case study on religion that you did yeah. for the exhibition because actually it contains some documents that you can look at if you're interested. That's yeah. true. We we did do um, one of the in this course we did a a case study and so I I tried to um, you know select some uh, representative documents that would help um, uh, help the participants in that course understand what those issues were. So but this. Um, but this is available to, to anyone, so you can definitely look at, uh, follow that link and, and get some more information. Thank you. And it was interesting to see on the first page of the letter you showed, uh, the first letter, that Sonia was going to Hebrew classes. Yes. And also to synagogue. I think it was once a week. And I, yeah, it, it's, it's sad to hear that that sounds as if that were an unusual occurrence. It, it, it was actually unusual and 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 Dr. Lipman always made a point of of detailing, you know, whether or not the child was re, was receiving religious instruction. And um, this was also the case in the West London synagogue. Unusually, they placed most of their children in boarding schools, which, of course, were not Jewish. Um, but they sent and they were very diligent about this. They either sent a teacher from the West London Synagogue to, you know, work with these children at least once a week, or they had a correspondence course. So they tried very hard to make sure that these children always stayed connected to um, to their Jewish teaching and their Jewish heritage. Thank you. Thank you very much for the, uh, the question and also the comments following. Um, so next we've got Anushka Alexander Rose, who's had a hand up. Um, you're waiting for a few minutes. Would you like to join us, Anushka? Hi, um, Jennifer, just quickly, and this is obviously an annoying thing to do because it's not a question, it's just a nice comment. Um, but I just, um, your research was so like really moving, I think. Um, I went to the school that Solomon, that Rabbi Dr. Solomon Schoenfeld founded, Hasmini in primary school. Um, so grew up, you know, constantly hearing about how amazing he was, but it was really nice to see this kind of, this side of it. Um, and also my grandfather came on the kinder transport and ah. he evacuated um and so reading looking at that letter that you that you showed about um the one kind of ex kind of exceptional letter um was very special to see because it was like oh you know that's exactly that's exactly the kind of thing he would have done and so just a general kind of thank you for doing very important you know very meaningful research and it was really it was really lovely to see it um so yeah thanks for that thank you Okay, um, and I think there's one more question in the uh, in the chat that I haven't come to yet, and it's from uh, Chana Kotsin. Um, I'll just read it out. This is from Chana. Thank you very much for your uh, comment. Um, this is for Karen Robson. Do you have records of Christian refugee organisations aiding Jewish adults or children, such as those created by Christadelphians, Quakers, or other groups? Okay. I think the best thing to say in response to that is um, I will take I've taken a note of your email address and I will contact you separately offline. I think that's much easier so I can we can review all, all your queries and, and actually send you a very detailed reply. So I should do that separately. I think that's very that's wise. All thank, right. you. thank you. Very, thank you very much. Um, I think that's an excellent way of dealing with the question. Um, can I just jump in really quickly? Of course, yeah, of course um, this Southampton also has the full um, records uh, that were um, microfilmed from the Central British Fund, which was the major Jewish um, refugee or rescue organization founded in 1933. Now, they're, they're not complete, um, but <laughs> interestingly, they did microfilm although very few re researchers had ever discovered these because they're in a weird place in this microfilm collection, but um, some um, kind of documents, the kinds like I've sh showed tonight and talked about um, that had to do with children that were under one particular home visitor in Birmingham. And there was a really active um, group of Christadelphians who took children in. So the, this, this material on microfilm, and again, I can email you with the direct references, um, gives a lot of insight from the refugee organization's perspective and some from the children's perspective 
on um, the issues that they had with Christadelphians. Thank you very much for that. Um, I think very detailed responses there and very helpful, I think, to China in terms of answering your question. Um, I'm sure you'll find out lots more about the records of the Parks Institute in due course. Um, so I wonder if at the moment we're coming up to, I think, we're not all that far, far a lot of time. So perhaps maybe unless anyone's got any kind of urgent questions or queries, perhaps maybe it's useful now, in fact, to hand over to those who have been helping to organise um, the event, but also to direct various institutes. So maybe I'd like to hand over now to Francis and Claire um, for a few final reflections and thanks. Just on a personal note, thank you very much to the audience um, and those who've written into the chat and also raised their hands and asked a series of, I think, quite wide ranging questions that have uh, tested all of our speakers today. Thank you very much. Thank you, George. Shall I go first? Yeah. Yeah, thank you to the audience and uh, really thank you very much to uh, Fran and to the team of the Jewish Mu Museum London for uh, having us. I would also like to thank uh, Moniza Siddiqui, who is our partnership manager at the Parks Institute and who has really created the link and made all of this happen. And uh, very many thanks also to Karen Robson, who has who always helps us and is very generous, but also very rigorous in the way she supports the Parks Institute. And she has been really very uh, crucial in all the, the digital exhibitions that we have created recently. So we, we showed the Kinder Transport one, but there is also a James Parks one. And finally, many <coughs> thanks to this wonderful, so enthusiastic and so inspiring uh, PhD community and PhD research. And I'll pass to you, Fran. I couldn't, couldn't said any better, Claire. Uh, I repeat absolutely all of those things. Um, and I think finally to, to the audience, and thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, really hope that we'll see you at, at some of our future events, both, our, both of our organisations, but also our, our future shared events. I think it's been such a brilliant experience come together to, to share all of this. So I think many more on the horizon, I, I hope. Um, I'll close the, close the event here. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, do keep in touch, uh, and I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks very much.